Hi, I'm Geoffrey Braithwaite, and it's an absolute pleasure to be delivering this keynote address to the Human Factors and Ergonomics Society of Australia on this, your 52nd annual conference. The topic of the conference is sustainable ergonomics. And I want to really capture some views about these two core concepts, these two complex core concepts, sustainable, sustainability, and ergonomics. And I'd like to do so in the context of healthcare. So let's just think this through at inception. There's a quote here that I'm using on my slides, which you can see. I know that sustainability is about being long lasting and productive over time, and ergonomics is about optimizing human well being and systems performance. But sustainable ergonomics? How does that work? What does that mean? Well, let me tell you the story back in Sydney in my research institute. I'm the founding director of the Australian Institute of Health Innovation. And what we do, 150 of us in Sydney, in a research institute at Macquarie University, is try to figure out how healthcare works, and then try and figure out through our research efforts how it can improve, how we can enhance care delivered to patients on the front lines of care. If that's not a big human factors ergonomics problem, I don't know what is. There's thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people working in healthcare. It's high tech, high touch, lots of technology, lots of people, lots of different kinds of people, lots of ologists delivering care. So this is a fantastic playground, a social laboratory uh, for understanding how people work, how they interface uh, with technology, how the socio-technical system gets inscribed in the care of patients. We've got three directors. Myself, I'm the founding director of the Institute and also run the Center for Healthcare Resilience and Implementation Science. I'll chat about that a bit later. Joanna Westbrook is an epidemiologist, a co-director of the Institute with me. She runs the Center for Health Systems and Safety Research. And Enrico Coira, he's a doctor who became a computer expert, a computer scientist, and he's interested in health informatics and big data. I say that not because I want to advertise the Institute, although I'm the founding director and I do a bit of marketing about our services. I say that because if your work here at the conference maps to any of the work of those three centers, I'm happy to be a gateway uh, to, uh, to introducing you to some of our work, especially if you want some synergistic partners who like reaching out and doing collaborative research. Next slide just shows our little sort of bio um, of me, Enrico, and Joanna, and the labels of our centers. And together we map to a large institute, as I indicated. And here's a wave from the folks back in Sydney to you at the conference. Also, I'd like to mention my co-presenters. Dr. Melissa Baysari is very well known to you, and she's here on stage at the moment. Um, Melissa is uh, one of the senior researchers in the Institute, and she's a human factor specialist, as you know, and she's also organizing and co-organizing with colleagues uh, the conference. And Dr. Robin Clay Williams, also a human factors um, specialist and expert. She was an aviator, whereas Melissa is a psychologist, um, and uh, Robin has done a lot of work looking at her expertise in aviation and what about safety and human factors in healthcare, two very complex areas. And she, uh, she borrows on her expertise in the past of being a pilot uh, to, to look at healthcare um, ergonomics, healthcare human factors, healthcare safety. So, okay, enough of that. That's by way of introduction. So let's get on with the actual show rather than me describing who I am, where I'm coming from, and Melissa and Robin's CVs. Firstly, ergonomics. I asked a couple of people in my institute in preparation for this talk. Somebody said back to me, isn't ergonomics all about comfy chairs? I'm gonna name and shame them. It was Dr. Kate Churaka, postdoctoral research fellow who works with me. Of course, she said that tongue in cheek because she too is a psychologist and she too is very interested in human factors and ergonomics. 
But I said to Kate, no, Kate, it's not. It's the scientific discipline concerned with the understanding of interactions amongst humans and other elements of a system and the profession that applies theory, principles, data and methods to design in order to optimize human well-being and overall system performance. In a lecturing sort of way back to Kate, as professors do sometimes to postdocs. But of course, that was tongue in cheek too. What we were both saying is that this is very complex. This is um, uh, um, a human inquiry into how do we make things better for other humans. That at base is what we're trying to do, in my opinion. And we all know that nothing lasts forever. Look at ye old world when people had flickering TVs compared to the new virtual world where we don't even need the TV. There's virtual reality projected into three-dimensional space. And ergonomics itself changes, not just the health system that I'm interested in improving, but ergonomics changes because environments change. People change. Stuff changes. In healthcare, techniques change. Technology is rampagingly changing. Ergonomics also changes because everything's complex and nothing's stable. So here's some variables that go to make up that complexity. Systems are local. They have multiple variables. Systems like healthcare. Healthcare is delivered in multiple settings by multiple people under multiple arrangements in many, many ways to deliver it. It's interacting agents and they create emergent behavior. And that's just a posh academic way of saying, you know, things happen in workplaces, delivering care to patients that we didn't anticipate, even from one moment to the next, let alone from one year to the next. So the, the notion of planning and doing design as ergonomics and human factors people tend to do has a real problem embedded in it because so much is changing. So ergonomics, I think, needs to flex, adapt, be dynamic, adjust continually. If we can achieve that, if we can achieve this kind of idea, marrying continuous improvement with ergonomics and human factors, maybe we could reach out and create new forms of sustainable ergonomics, which is, of course, the title of the topic we're trying to tackle here. So what would we need to do to create new forms of sustainable ergonomics? Well, let me give you some hope. There's help at hand. Two fields that we have done a lot of work on and published a number of books and white papers on are this idea of resilience engineering applied to healthcare. And in your view, in, in the ergonomics and human factors society's view, you would frame that as uh, not resilience engineering, but how do you improve on the ground care based on human factors and ergonomics? And also the second topic I'd like to cover is complexity science. Because I think sometimes we do take a linear view of change and improvement. We took, take, many of us take ergonomics and human factors ideas and say, let's put those in place, let's roll them out. And I do think we sometimes misalign that problem with the fact that we're dealing with heavy complexity. It's a complex adaptive system. So I'd like to talk about these two topics resilience engineering and complexity science. So I'm riffing on the theme of sustainable ergonomics. Firstly, resilience engineering. So we've contributed to a definition of what resilience engineering is. And let's put it up on the screen. It's the performance of a system. So the performance of a system is said to be resilient if it can adjust its functioning prior to, during, or following changes. Events that change or are disturbed or there are opportunities that are exploited and thereby it sustains required operations under both expected and unexpected conditions. So there's this notion in resilience engineering that a, the performance of the system comprises a lot of events that need to flex and adjust because they have 
external impact factors and internal impact factors that can perturb, disturb the system. But it's a system that has to keep on keeping on. Or if you want a shorthand of that, a summary, it's the system's ability to adjust the way things are done. So Holnagel, and with Paris, Woods and Rethel here in a model in 2011, but there's quite a number of models and these have been, um, these have been adjusting over time, says there's four aspects of resilient healthcare. So people working embedded deeply in complex systems like healthcare need to know what to expect, they need to anticipate, they need to know what to look for, they need to monitor performance, they need to respond, know what to do in situ in their settings, and they need to know what's happened just now or in the more distant past, i.e. they need to learn. So these four attributes of resilience, cornerstones of resilience in complex settings, anticipating, monitoring, responding and learning come from our work in resilient healthcare. Okay, so, so far that's a bit of theory and I'm sure this resonates with many people in the audience. But what does it mean in terms of resilience, really resilient ideas at work? Well, let me discuss that in one slide just to set that scene. Many people hold the view that organizations function because of some sort of organization chart. There's a CEO at the top, layers of organizational management, and then the people at the, in the foothills on the front lines of the system delivering the services. And in healthcare, those are clinicians who deliver care to patients. So there's some sort of model in our heads, a very prominent model, that the world works that way and that policies and uh, resources and instructions flow down through the hierarchy to the people on the front lines. That's an imperfect picture of how things actually work. Because in the second diagram, what you see is the messy, imprecise, deceptive, um, layered uh, health system which comprises a lot of informalities in contrast to the formalities of the hierarchy in the organization chart. In other words, healthcare, and I'm sure those of you not in healthcare, in other sectors, in other industries, in other organizations, know that you work in a complex adaptive system as well. So resilience has called to attention this point that it's not hierarchical healthcare or, that, uh, or, or any organization that only in, un, incompletely describes how the system works. The system really works because of a lot of interaction and emergent behaviors from interacting agents. As another idea drawn from resilient healthcare, um, and this is another resilient idea at work, is the people in the upper, upper echelons don't actually have a full or complete knowledge of what's happening on the front lines in any organization, but especially in the health system where it's so complex. So there's lots and lots of care delivered on the front lines of, a, of the health system in GP practices, hospitals, aged care facilities, rehabilitation, in clinics, everywhere. And the people who are trying to effect change on those are doing what we've described as work as imagined. We and others have described as work as imagined. Work as imagined as in I'm a CEO in the upper echelons of a system, or I'm a regulator, or I'm somebody with a purse strings wanting to uh, uh, pay, pay salaries for people to do work. I'm remote from the, uh, the coalface, the front lines. And what I want to do is try and influence what happens, get more productivity, for example, or more efficiency, uh, a great human factors ergonomics word, efficiency, um, to, uh, to provide, in my, in my world, better care. And what I will do there is fund and issue policies and suggest ways that, that the people on the front lines at the coalface have to work. When people are in those uh, situations and they're doing work as imagined, essentially what they're doing is um, trying to constrain or enable certain types of behavior on the front lines of, of the system. And the time frame for that is really years or months or at best, weeks. Because you can't just 
turn an organization, a large complex organization around by issuing a policy. And therefore it turns around on a dime, as the Americans are prone to say. Look at the other end of the telescope where work is done. Work as done is different in its very nature. It doesn't work, especially in healthcare, but probably nowhere, on years or months or weeks. It works in minutes and days maximum. And in healthcare, there's a lot of people working very furiously, providing care to patients, doing operations, providing treatment, uh, caring for people in beds and in general practices and in clinics, who really have a steady flow of patients coming through. They have to be diagnosed, tested, treated, discharged, uh, moved on to the next phase of their care, uh, treated in their home, treated in the community, followed up. Um, and, and really, the whole flow of work is much more in minutes or weeks, especially, for example, in a busy ward, in an acute setting, in a large teaching hospital. So there's a bit of a mismatch here. We've got two different worlds. Now, there's many worlds in reality. This is an idealized situation. But we've got the worlds of the people doing work as imagined, trying to influence the system, and the people delivering the uh, services in the system, in our place, the care provided to patients, who are doing work as done. So one of the traps in systems, from an ergonomics and human factors point of view, is some workers imagined folks have some sort of linear mechanistic view of the system. In other words, if I issue a policy, A, B will happen in a one-to-one -one correspondence so that I'll be shaping through my policies, through my allocation of resources, through my demands, through my instructions, through my suggestions to the front lines, that they work in certain ways. A leads to B. But the resilient healthcare and complexity science have pointed to something much more different to that. The world doesn't work that way. Certainly no one on the front lines, whether they're a uh, camera operator or a professor teaching people or doing research or a clinician delivering care to patients or someone in a mine uh, digging for coal or whatever, they work not the way the prescriptivists or the people in the policy manual want them to, but they have discretion. They are human beings with agency. So there's no one-to-one -one correspondence, or very little one-to-one -one correspondence, despite what policymakers think, or perhaps hope, to the way work gets done. I work in a university. The Deputy Vice-Chancellor and the Vice-Chancellor don't come and micromanage me when I go in and teach in a classroom, or, when, or which paper I'm going to write, or which study I'm going to do, or which grant I'm going to apply for. They do issue policies. And there's many of them in my institution, as there is in every university. But they don't prescribe how I do in reality. I work in an enlightened university, but in some universities, there's a possibility that the DVCs, the deputy vice chancellors, and the vice chancellors think they're actually enabling or constraining the behavior of the academics, telling them what research to do and when to do it. That's not going to happen. And that's a good example of discretion on the front lines. There's lots of that in healthcare. So let's have a quick look at a study that I've looked at, that I've done with colleagues, to exemplify this. We worked concertedly in the eastern suburbs of Sydney with a translational cancer research network. This is a network of people that we put together with a grant, with a, with a, with a, a, a study in mind, where we put together researchers who were researching how is it that we can get more evidence into practice? So cancer care is more evidence-based in the technical language we use in healthcare. We were working with oncologists, that is cancer specialists, who deliver that care. Cancer specialists, doctors, but also nurses and allied health professionals on the clinical team who deliver care to patients. And on this graph, what I'm showing is at three points in time, how we'd work together more collaboratively increasingly to get more evidence into care and deliver more collaboratively this research clinical practice nexus, to, to, to bridge this nexus, to create more collaboration in effect. So as you can see in 2012, we had some interaction, the circles, the little dots of people, 
and the lines connecting them are how interactive and collaborative they were. So when we first started the grant in 2012 uh, to try and induce more evidence-based care through research and uh, uh, practice, uh, we had this level of interaction. By 2014, we had much more collaboration going on. We worked hard to try and get evidence into practice and have researchers and clinicians working much more collaboratively together. By 2015, we had a, almost a riot on our hands. As you can see in the three graphs, we've really got collaboration going. Now, just a slight rider on this. Um, uh, we don't know yet, and that's the next stage in our research, whether this is actually delivering much better care to patients. But what we do know is from humble beginnings, we really had the collaborative group working together very intensively. So that is really encouraging. And there aren't many studies that do social network analysis, that's the kind of research that this is, for those of you who don't do this sort of research or aren't familiar with it. Um, social network analysis, really powerful tool. Not many people do this longitudinally. Mostly they take a snapshot of how, how collaborative are people and how interactive are they and what's the network like at this point in time. Doing this longitudinally, as you can see, has great power in understanding group dynamics. Let me take this approach one further step. So we did some work earlier in social network analysis that's quite a neat study that's interesting. It was part of Nerida Creswick's PhD that Professor Joanna Westbrook, who I introduced you to earlier in an earlier slide, and I supervised. So we went into an emergency department. This is where, you know, people are in a big rush. You've seen, you've seen the movies and TV and uh, some documentaries. This is where people are in a great rush. There's a constant flow of patients. They come in by ambulance or as walking wounded, needing to have care immediately. They can't really wait. They've got to be triaged, that is assessed, and either given treatment or referred to someone else, maybe back to the GP or something like that. So what we were looking at was 105 people in an emergency department, how interactive they were they, and we asked them some questions and created different network maps. So this first map you see, um, where doc nurses are blue, doctors are red, allied health are yellow, and admin and support are green, comprising the 105 members of the team. And the size of the circle means how senior you are in the system, how long you've been there. And we asked them, who would you go to, each of the 105 of them, if you had a problem? So this creates this problem-solving network. And as you can see, again, like the earlier diagram of the cancer uh, network, we've got a pretty good network going on here. Lots of people said that they would go to lots of other people in the network if they had a problem. So there's lots of lines, uh, technical term vectors, between the nodes, that's the technical term for the people in the circles. This is encouraging. This is kind of like, at first glance, this is the sort of emergency department you'd like to go to because people are collaborating. They would go to lots of people. But notice the colors. Notice the colors. Nurses are blue, doctors are red, allied health are yellow, and admin and support are green. So who would people go to if they had a problem? Someone in their own tribe. Someone like them. Doctors go to doctors, nurses to nurses, etc. Then we asked a second question. We said to the same group, who would you go to if you had a medication problem? So this is the medication advice seeking network. The network structure changes. However, it's still pretty dense. All the admin and support who don't really have medication problems because they're doing admin work rather than treating patients go to the edge. But notice the colors again. The technical term for this is homophily. And what it means is birds of a feather flock together. And so this network is also dominated by tribalness. People would go to someone like them. And then we ask them a really interesting question, the most interesting question of all. Who do you socialize with? Here's the socializing network. Notice it's not as dense. In other words, you might work with people intensively, go to them for advice or, or provide them with advice, but you don't necessarily have to go to coffee with them or lunch. You don't have to have a social relationship, you might have to have a work relationship, but socialization, when we did ask it, it's a less dense network, but it's still under the principle of homophily. People you go to, uh, go to uh, coffee with or lunch are someone like me. 
Now, we've been talking in healthcare about the importance of multidisciplinary teamwork. We've been saying you must have a multidisciplinary team to enable care to be delivered in better ways. But this suggests that we've got a long way to go. And we're still inherently monodiscipline and tribal. And that's a human factors and ergonomics problem. Because how do we deliver good care? By people working in teams. How do we exploit new practices, new uh, technology? By people having teamwork um, when, they, when they provide care. So we've got, a, we've got a way to go here. So let me summarize this idea of lessons for ergonomics from our studies in resilient healthcare and how resilience works. I'm describing this as new rules from, for an old problem. And then we'll pause. Don't ever think getting change in practice is easy, whether in healthcare or elsewhere. Progress will always be hard work. There's nothing, there's no simplistic solutions really to most of the thorny problems we face. Linear solutions, i.e. let's just tip a new policy into the system or a new piece of technology and expect it to work, that will only get you so far. And sometimes it'll get you nowhere fast. Our suggestion from our studies in resilient healthcare is to work with the natural characteristics of the system and always look out for unintended consequences. Some more new rules for an old problem just to complete a set of 10 that we'd like to suggest to you. Don't do it alone. It's a system of systems. Harness others. There's lots of people in a complex system that can help in a resilient system. And we've apparently given lots of titles to such people. Mavens, cosmopolites, bridges, brokers, opinion leaders. If you don't know what a maven is, read Gladwell's The Tipping Point or go and look it up on Wiki. Oh, did I say Wiki? I mean, go and look it up in the scholarly literature. I'm a professor, so I should give you that advice. Another point is you'll need institutional support as well. We think there's a strong case, and I'm going to come to this after, the, um, after the, the short break we're going to induce, is to look at what goes right and think why. And also, I think a good motto for us all in ergonomics and human factors is to think about doing more things, going, to try and induce more things going right, rather than always looking for the problems and things going wrong. But let me pause and let me ask you this question via Melissa and Robin. What are your questions so far? So, I know Mel and Robin will have answered any questions or fielded any uh, comments that you have made. But if there are any others, on the last slide are my contact details and you can always email me and we're going to have a bit of a chat that way as by way of follow-up. So, so far we've had a look at our work on resilient healthcare, which I'm sure resonates with many of you in terms of your own human factors and uh, ergonomics interests. I just want to turn to something else that we've been working on something on for a number of years now. And this is this idea of complexity science applied to improvement in settings. And again, I'll draw on our examples in healthcare. So we've published a white paper that's widely available. In fact, we can make a copy um, widely available. And we've got uh, some available through Robin and Melissa um, at the conference. And the idea of that was to say something deceptively simple but inherently complicated. And that is this. Many of us, and I've hinted at this in the resilience sort of uh, analysis, m many of us treat what we are trying to achieve as a linear problem, but it's actually a complex system that we're applying it to. So it's very easy for a policymaker to issue policy, say, you know, here's a code of conduct or a way that you must practice or um, a, pro a project that you must do or in our, in our health system, you know, you must do a root cause analysis if there's a big problem or you must wash your hands every time you see a patient and after you leave a patient and just before you do a procedure and so on and so forth. And you must do it in a prescribed way. So we issue policies and standard operating procedures. If we do that excessively 
as an instruction, as a linear solution to a complex problem, we're going to miss the point because it's a complex adaptive system where, as I said earlier, there's lots of agency and people use lots of discretion and they do workarounds and they don't deliver care the way, they, the, the way that we think they do as enunciated in the policy manual. So we wrote this white paper. Here's, uh, here's a, a screenshot of it, but it's available to you. Um, and we're starting to think, what can ergonomics learn from complexity science? So here's half a dozen suggestions. One is healthcare is complex. It's a complex adaptive system. It's adaptive without top-down initiatives. In other words, healthcare has got a mind of its own and people do different things and workarounds and decide how to deliver care without waiting for instructions from up above. They just do their job in ways that they decide with high levels of discretion individually and in teams. So things are dynamic. The system, in point of fact, is dynamic. Behaviors are emergent. They emerge from the interactions of the teams and the individuals and they're interfacing with technology. That's not that prescribable. You can't capture it all in a policy. So in other words, bottom-up behaviors produce localized rules which are overlaid on top of the policies and standard operating procedures and clinical guidelines that apply. So in short, in a system described that way, the way we've been describing it through complexity lens or a resilience lens is such that linear models will only get you so far. So we need to distinguish between complicated and complex. So complicated is like building a rocket ship. It's like getting to the moon. It's like doing Voyager to the outer solar system. That's very, very complicated, but it's actually predictable. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to get the rocket ship to go to the moon. Uh, uh, engineering is very complicated with lots of formulas and s maths and stats. However, it's not necessarily complex. Something is complex when there's high degrees of interrelatedness, which something like getting a rocket to the moon is, but it's also got a number of components and the, the interface of those is also compromised or described by the fact that people have high levels of discretion. So things move from complicated to complex because there's emergent behaviors and there's lots of interactions that you can't really predict. So there's a level of uncertainty and unpredictability in a complex adaptive system. So getting a rocket to the moon can be a complex system, but the actual facility to do so is complicated. Now, there's four things about complex adaptive systems. The first one is they comprise agents that interact in ways that you can't really be certain of. There's a large number of individual agents. They have sense-making abilities, i.e. they've got discretion. They process information about their local environment. They can change their behavior in response. They flex and adjust. They behave according to their own simple rules, not necessarily policies and standard operating procedures. And they often have conflicting goals and behaviors. They don't always agree. So this politics. So in healthcare, we've got lots of different kind of agents interacting. It's a big melting pot, a melange of things going on. Second feature of a complex adaptive system is the interdependency of the agencies, agents. They're not just independent, they are interdependent. There's lots of connections between them, as described by the social network analysis we did earlier. So they exchange information. The information they exchange and the work they do affects each other. They're connected and sometimes disconnected. And the interactions give rise to structures and patterns that we call teams, groups, cliques, uh, uh, process groups. The third thing is it's dynamic. And that means behaviors are nonlinear. You can't predict them ahead of time. Inputs are not proportional to the outputs. So people give people resources and they can disproportionately do things with them. Small changes can have big effects. The agent's interactions may be limited, but their influence can be huge. So one person can be disproportionately influential in the system. You can't predict that. You can't write a job description for that difference between somebody who's got no influence and just does their job and somebody who's got huge influence and just does their job. 
And the effects can carry across the system and reverberate across time. The fourth thing is there are rules and governance. Yes, there are rules and governance in the policy delivered by the people doing the work as imagined, but there are rules and governance based on the patterns of interactions between the agents and their interdependencies. In other words, complex adaptive systems self-organize. They don't wait for the organization structure to determine what they do. They do stuff in good and bad ways. So control and the patterns of behaviors is always distributed in complex adaptive systems. So back to linear thinking. Now that I've described a complex adaptive system, and I've described yours I know, even though I've been thinking in my mind about healthcare, people do a lot of linear thinking. In fact, the architecture of the brain is, oh, if I do this, this will be the consequence, this will happen. It's very seductive to think in linear ways. But linear thinking assumes perfect cause and effect. Like, if I do this, that'll happen. And it's reductionist. It sort of, it wishes away all the complexity. You can do research using these sort of methods, randomized trials, controlled trials, use statistics, do top-down interventions to try and change behaviors on the front lines of a system. However, you won't get what you want. You will often not get much that you want if you think about this as a linear problem, and sometimes you won't get anything that really resembles what you started out wanting. So let me give you a clear example. Let's talk about obesity. I hope not many of you are obese. But it is a rampaging thing, and many of us are carrying a bit more weight than we'd like. So in uh, uh, some people's minds, that's a linear problem. Fewer calories, more exercise, and you're gonna look like this. Unfortunately not, because obesity looks like this. And this is a famous map, famous in my world anyway, by Butland and colleagues in 2007, which tried to map how obesity works and what the factors are that go to make up the circumstances in which someone might become obese. And there's factors like, you're not meant to read this, it's just for illustrations, but you can. You can go to Butland and have a look at it in more detail if you're interested. There's factors like social psychology at work, food production, how we produce food, how we distribute food, how we consume food, the physiology of individuals, individual uh, physiology as well as group, uh, uh, psych individual psychology as well as group psychology, individual physical activity versus group activity, and the physical activity environment. Do you have, do you have access? to a gym? Do you have the motivation for a gym? Do you have the um, capacity to resist all those calories that are available in the modern world? So linear is deceptively simplistic. It looks at a problem like obesity and says that's solvable, but actually it's a complex uh, problem. So how do we put this all together to do sustainable ergonomics? Let me give you some summary points before we move to showing you some studies and then finalizing. Our suggestion after thinking this for a long time, and my suggestion to you, is don't focus myop myopically just on a problem. Look for the internet interconnections. That will get you out of a linear mode if that's your propensity. And most of us have a propensity to think in a linear way, some of the time at least. Consider that you can't actually see very far ahead. Things happen when you least expect it. Look for patterns in a system's behavior if you're doing human factors and ergonomics, not just at events. Be careful if attributing cause and effect. It's rarely that simple. And I'd strongly suggest generate new ideas beyond your own resources when tackling problems. Most of the problems we face are complex problems. Otherwise, we'd have solved them ages ago. All the simple problems have already been fixed. That's almost definitional of human factors and ergonomics. So when tackling problems, look beyond your own ideas to other people. This is a team sport. This requires multiple people and the wisdom of crowds. Keep in mind the system's dynamic and it doesn't necessarily respond to intended change as predicted. Some suggestions that we have from our group in our white paper are, where possible, model the system's properties. Look at the circumstances surrounding the problem and not just the problem you're trying to address. Use system tools at your disposal, and we outline a number in our white paper. And that's a freebie. You can have that and read it 
to your heart's content. It applies to your industry even if you don't work in healthcare. And the sort of tools that we have at our disposal are sociograms, social network diagrams like I've been using, through to systems diagrams, to soft systems methodology, to role plays, to simulation, before we affect change on the system. My advice to ergonom er is that the right word? Ergo ergonomists? Or human factors people? Maybe it's easier to say that. Use your intuition. Do your best. There's usually no definite or right answer, even though we'd like to believe many of us that there's a definite or right answer. Do some experimentation before you try and implement some new thing. Aim for minimum specification. For us, we're trying to say to clinicians, let's give the patient broad goals, but try to leave the details to some of the details to them. Our prescribed solution to patients or our prescribed solution to the health system might not fit their life or their practices. You've got to leave some wiggle room for people. They're going to take it anyway. So over prescribing, almost no one just follows compliantly the rules. Chunk things together is a bit more advice to ergonomists, human factors people. Problems are often dealt with not as isolated events, but as holistic problems in clusters. Make use of metaphor. Shared understanding can follow. Metaphors are very powerful. And use the provocative question. Questions that might uncover some basic assumptions people are making, which can be mistaken. So let me just pause, and then I'm going to move on to the end to give some examples using resilience thinking and complexity science that we've been working with by way of finalizing my talk. But I wonder if I should pause and ask Mel and Robin if they want to interface with you as the audience one penultimate time before finishing. So I'm not here in the room to, uh, to workshop the questions or comments. Mel and Robin are doing that. But what I want to turn to is the last bit. And what I'd like to do is, where does the rubber hit the road here? How have we married up all these complex things? Resilient thinking, complexity science, human factors and ergonomics, trying to apply ideas to improve the health system. So let's run through a few. I won't labor the point because I'd like to get to a final bit where we workshop a few final questions or take a few final observations. One example is this notion of safety one and safety two. So I know we'd like to keep patients safe in healthcare. You, next time you're in uh, the system or come to the system for care, would like to be kept safe. So what we've done in healthcare a lot for a long time is tried to reduce the number of errors that occur in the system to make you safe when you come in as a patient. So using resilience thinking and complexity science, we reframed that. And we thought about this idea of safety too, which and Eric Holnagel from Denmark is one of the major proponents of this. So the amazing thing about healthcare isn't that it produces harm in say one in 10 admissions to hospital, which is what the number seems to be from many studies. The amazing thing about healthcare is in a system this complex, it manages to produce no harm care, care which does not deliver harm, in 90% of cases, considering how complex patients' conditions are, how vulnerable they are, how much we do to them, how many comorbidities, complexities they have, um, that's the amazing thing about healthcare. So we've set up a whole paradigm in resilient healthcare thinking, saying, how come this resilient health system delivers so much good care? It's almost the antidote to us always looking for problems. In this second example, we were working with oncologists, clinicians who treat cancer, who uh, treat uh, Lynch syndrome. That's a syndrome that uh, means you have a propensity for colon cancer. So we asked the oncologists what they did, and they did work as imagined. They sort of said, well, we sort of screen people, and if they're high risk, we refer them. And then we looked at what they actually did, sent some people in a research team into their environment and looked at their entire system. And this is what they actually did much more complex. It's a complex adaptive system. They didn't construe it that way. 
So a lesson for ergonomics, a lesson for human factors is, even people embedded in systems that you might ask f for their opinion, don't understand the whole system that they belong to. A third example is we try to induce more interprofessional practice. In a way, this is a remedy to that earlier study where we had the people in the uh, emergency department not working as a multidisciplinary team, but working in their own tribes and silos. So we did a study for four years in the Australian Capital Territory at the Canberra Hospital, looking at how people did uh, their work interprofessionally as a multidisciplinary team, essentially. So we spent four years with them doing this on a large Australian Research Council grant. This first graph is the number of activities that um, uh, we did with those people, projects essentially, to try and get them to be involved with more team-oriented, team-based care. The next slide is how many encounters the research team that we deployed into the system with the ARC funding, uh, how many times they encountered uh, people in the system, how many, how many times we interacted with them. It was almost two and a half thousand over four years. Then we did something really interesting. In the years two, three, and four, we measured people's attitudes with a questionnaire survey about how interprofessional they now felt they were. And as you can see from that graph, their attitudes flatlined in years two, three, and four. We didn't budge their attitudes despite all this activity. And what that means is you can do a lot of work with people but you may not actually change their attitudes to what you're trying to do with them. And that's a big problem for us. Now, somebody once unkindly, when I gave this talk in a real conference, not virtually, as I'm being projected into your life, somebody up the back unkindly said, did you give the money back? Well, no, I didn't give the money back because as you know with research, by the time you get the results, you've already spent the money. And you can see the humor that we were trying to induce more teamwork, and we did a lot of stuff, but we didn't actually change the attitudes of people to teamwork. But the point is, I think, is a more compelling one. It is very hard to make change even in a two, three, or four year time horizon. The change we're trying to do, me as a researcher, you as an ergonomist or a uh, human factors person, is long-term change. Another example, and this is from the work of Joanna Westbrook, is we've got a tool to measure work. It's a handheld, uh, and you can, you can measure what people are doing. Are they doing direct patient care, or indirect patient care, or documentation, or talking to a patient, or having a case conference, or gossiping? And you can, um, with the handheld, measure how much time people are spending. I like time and motion. That could be quite useful for people doing ergonomics or human factor studies. And that tool is available from Joanna Westbrook if you want to use it. And we think it's modifiable to non-health settings, although we've set it up to measure clinical work. That's quite useful if you're trying to uh, do, do some work to um, improve the interface between technology and people or people and people. That's the Wombat tool. And I've got a couple of slides showing that and a few papers that Joanna Westbrook has published. Another example, and I'm coming to a close, is what's a high-performing organization? Well, I don't completely know the answer to that but I do know what a high-performing hospital looks like because we've done a systematic study of this. And this diagram shows the factors. And there are seven factors in what create a high-performing hospital. We published this paper in 2015. It's really going like hotcakes and it's being cited many, many times across the world. So the seven features of a high-performing hospital read high-performing organization in your terms. Positive organization culture, receptive and responsive senior management, performance monitoring, but I don't mean necessarily, right, we're gonna monitor your performance, mate. I mean, people are sensibly monitoring what's happening in the organization for their own purposes. Building the workforce, and especially building the workforce of the future, expertise-driven practice, interdisciplinary teamwork, despite how hard I've said that is, and effective distributed leadership. Not just leadership coming from the top of the Christmas tree, the top of the hierarchy, but effective distributed leadership, in other words, leadership at all levels. They are what we think is the blueprint for an effective, high-performing hospital based on lots and lots of literature we've crunched. It might have application and resonance with you. I finalize with, I finish with a few models just putting this idea of how do you make change in a less linear, more interactive way, and I just leave them uh, for your interest, and you can follow them up if you like. One's a model 
of providing a plan for implementation science in our world, how to get more evidence into practice, how to improve the way care is delivered. Another one is, well, what do you do to create implementation at scale? And Robin can talk about that because she's the lead author on this paper. And in final comments, before Mel and Robin take any final questions or observations from you, here's my concluding slide. The world is not simple, although we sometimes treat it as if it is. Maybe that's just a way we have of getting by, um, trying to get from one stage to another in our work. I think you, we, it beholds us, on the basis of my talk here, to appreciate the natural resilience of everyday work, how people flex and adjust and do workarounds and morph their work rather than just carry faithfully out um, uh, guidelines or rules or standard operating procedures or instructions. I think it behoves us in the ergonomics human factors community, if I can admit to being part of your community, if you let me in, to embrace complexity thinking. I think we need that if we're going to create sustainable ergonomics. So thanks for listening. Robin and Mel will take more questions or your observations. They'll feed them back to me or you can email me directly. If you like this stuff, here's some recently published books from me and my group, as well as a lot of academic papers. Here's some forthcoming books. And finally, here's how to contact me if you would like to. Thank you for letting me into your life via video link for this uh, presentation.